Oh, we are muted. Hi, everyone on the computer. Um, okay, I hope you can hear me. Um, I believe we'll be taking questions from the computer group um, at the end, um, but um, please let us know if there's any issues otherwise technologically. Um, so just to uh, explain who I am, I'm coming from the University of Colorado, as you can see, our lovely campus here uh, sprawling in the Aurora, Colorado. Um, and I am a Movement Disorders First Year Fellow. It is a two-year fellowship. And to explain what that actually means is I am a licensed, I'm a certified neurologist, but doing extra training in Parkinson's disease, in tremors, in various different movement disorders for two years so that I can kind of hone my focus for my clinical training from that. Um, my interests are Parkinson's disease in general, um, particularly uh, caregiver and quality of life needs. Um, and I also have um, in my heart a special place for rural care, um, which is something I'd like to do in my future um, practice is kind of expand on the um, access for Parkinson's patients in rural areas. Um, welcome, we're just getting started. Um, there's coffee and um, snacks over there okay. if you'd like some. Just to say, I'm, I'm Dr. Heiser, I'm a Movement Disorders Fellow, come from University of Colorado. Okay. So um, this talk is going to be an overview of medications and some of the um, non-medication therapies, but really focused in on medications and um, really an update on the newer things that are out there. But I do like to kind of start at the base of the pyramid and go over everything and not miss anything because I think you need to know the basics before we can talk about the additives and the, the, the uh, newer things that are out there. Um, so, oh, I have a little clicker I'm supposed to use. Okay. Uh oh, it was working a second ago. Okay, I'll just use that. That's fine. Um, so, I was just wondering if I can make this smaller. I don't know if there's a way for me to make this part smaller. You guys, yeah, this thing so that I'm not blocking stuff. Let's see. No, I don't wanna quit. Maybe hide control panel. Yeah. There we go. Very nice, okay. Um, so I have no personal disclosures. I am a trainee. Um, and I did want to thank, though, Jessica Barr, which many of you may know. Um, she's our PA at the Movement Disorders Center. She provided many of these slides, and I've updated them further, but she gives me the groundwork to work off of, so I'm really very indebted to her. Um, so goals, again, was to review new medications, and new being just about anything that isn't Cinemet. We'll go over a little bit what that means, um, but starting all the way back there and moving on up. Um, and then at the very end, I'd also like to discuss ongoing and upcoming research that we have at the Movement Disorders Center um, that we are actively enrolling for. Um, and then obviously, um, if it's if it's okay, um, if we can take kind of questions at the end so that I can allow the people online to also participate with that. Um, so a little history just for people. I know, again, this might be repeat for a lot of people, but again, I like to start at the ground up. Um, a little bit of history of where we've been from a medication standpoint for Parkinson's. Um, it was first described as Dr. Parkinson, who literally wrote like three papers and that's it. He described Parkinson's disease and then just kind of went off and we that's what we know him for. Um, but he described it as the shaking palsy. Um, fascinatingly, he actually only studied six patients, three patients of his own and three people he saw out walking the streets and said, hey, I think I have this disease that I can kind of describe. And he described um, it very well, um, just from six patients. So it took a, a while um, until we started understanding just beyond that clinical understanding of what this disease was. But pathologists help us understand that the disease was a damage due to the substantia nigra, which you can see, let me see if this little pointer works here. Um, so from this cut in the brain, we're kind of low in that deeper area of the brain. And there's this little area called the substantia nigra, um, which you can see is kind of darker, nigra being like a, a term for, like a Latin term in, involving darkness. Um, and so that essentially is um, damaged. And that is the area that dopamine is produced from. 
Um, in the 1950s, that's what was discovered. It took from 1817 when people said there's this disease called Parkinson's disease until the 1950s until they understood what chemical was being depleted. So that's a long time. Um, and so really we didn't actually have any medications from 1817 till 1961 to provide to patients. Um, and the first the first drug was levodopa, really, that was used on, a, on an extensive basis. And as we, as many of us know, levodopa is pretty much what everybody uses still to this day. So um, we've it's been a long journey, and I will say we have come a long way, but we still have that basis from the 1960s that we work off of. Um, Again, so this will help when I'm describing what medications do, Parkinson's terminology. So Parkinsonism is the clinical findings of Parkinson's disease. And the, the main four constellation of symptoms that everybody experiences to some degree or partial degree um, is slowness, stiffness, that resting tremor, um, and gait instability with the risk of falls. Um, you do not have to have tremor to have Parkinson's disease, and that's often a trip up for a lot of people that take a while to get diagnosed because that's what we, that's, it's very visible to see, right? You have to have slowness, that bradykinesia is the other Latin term for it. Um, and so when we talk about medications, we talk about being on medications, and so that's on time. Um, and so whenever the medications aren't working, we call that the off time. That's when that you know, before you were on medications, that, that's what you felt. Um, so that's the worst end of the Parkinson systems. On time, to various different degrees, people will describe that slowness, stiffness, tremor. Oftentimes people say, I feel less anxious. I feel just more energy. I feel less fatigue. Um, those all wrap up in the medications as well. Um, then, of course, we talk about these ebbs and flows, this on and off time. And sometimes when we hit on, we hit a little too on. And that is often experienced as um, peak dose effects. And the most common one is dyskinesias. And um, oftentimes I see a lot of patients that don't know what that is because they've never experienced it. Um, but that's that kind of wriggly, writhing, dancing movement often starts in the head and shoulders. And usually family members notice it before patients notice it. And sometimes patients aren't bothered with it. And if it doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother me. But sometimes it does become problematic and troublesome to people, and then that's when we have to start dealing with adjustments of those medications. So that's kind of the basis. So I talked about how we have levodopa as our basis from the 1960s. This is where we are pretty much today, um, and I think um, I just about updated everything, but there is some more that I'm going to go into from just this. But as you can see, we have a ton of medications that we can work with. Um, and they are all kind of based off of that levodopa treatment and either being adjuvants or alternatives for it. Um, and so a lot of times there's been a lot of movement of kind of actually doing, even though we talk about not really wanting polypharmacy for a lot of our patients, oftentimes mixtures and at, at like multiple medications can actually be beneficial for our patients um, because there's so much of that ebb and flow to the on and off times. So I'm not gonna get too into the weeds. We don't all have to go to med school today, um, but just to have an understanding of where we're coming from. So when we give levodopa, we can't, they used to actually just give levodopa alone and they used to give huge amounts of the medication to patients and they all threw up, they all felt miserable. Yeah, they weren't shaking, but they couldn't barely get out of bed. And so we had to, um, they eventually developed carbidopa. So you hear us say carbidopa levodopa, which is like, sounds like a tongue twister until you say it a million times for your work. Um, but what that's doing, this is a little blocking symbol. So what's that, what carbidopa actually does, that's not the medication that you need. That's not replacing dopamine. What it's doing is it's halting the um, L-dopa, the dopamine, from breaking down outside of the brain. This is your blood brain barrier. So this is your brain, this is your body. This stops it from just being torn up before it even gets into your brain. So it's, that's where that nausea comes from because dopamine into your gut system solo is extremely nauseous. So that's, that helps a lot with the nausea, but it also helps the dopamine get into the brain where it needs to be. Um, and then we have um, the L-dopa is the actual drug. It gets broken down into dopamine and then it has to be excreted and brought into the dopamine receptors. Um, which is what actually like activates movement in the brain is actually activating those receptors. 
So um, the, the dopamine gets excreted out into the area where the receptors live, and then eventually it gets taken back up and, and destroyed, um, or just recycled, I should say. Um, so we can give dopamine, but we can also do a lot here to keep dopamine in your system as long as possible. So there's different medications that help things hang around and not get sucked back up or broken down. So to start with the basics is the levodopa replacement. Um, we have a lot of different types of ways of getting it into the system. The most basic is Cinemet, um, which like I said, actually just means sin enemis, emesis, sin being Latin for non. So it's without nausea, um, emesis being the word for nausea. Um, but you can still have a lot of side effects with that, um, especially at that peak dose as it's highest in your system. That would be nausea, um, lightheadedness, particularly feeling that drop in blood pressure as we go from sitting to standing. So it's kind of a little bit of a blood pressure medication. Um, and then generally later on in the disease, we can have peak dose hallucinations, um, which can be frightening for people. And we generally don't want them, you know, too active because they can be dangerous for the patient because they can maybe run out of the house or anything like that. We don't want that happening. Um, so there's different things to kind of to get rid of that peak dose and those are our sustained and ex extended release products. Um, so Cinemet IR is kind of your basis. Cinemet CR um, is a little bit longer lasting and a little bit softer of a peak um, but it doesn't absorb as well. So you generally actually have to be on higher amounts of medication, higher pills, high, higher pill count. Um, Ritari is fairly new, um, and instead of being a tablet, it's actually a capsule with a little, thousands of little beads in it. Um, and the beads are all different release lengths, so it, it is supposed to smooth everything out. So it lasts longer, it's smoother. You generally don't have to take the medication as often during the day. Um, but people still have a little bit of that fluctuation with it as as with every medication. Um, so Ritari is something that oftentimes once people start having a lot of fluctuations, we kind of discuss about switching to Ritari. Um, there's also, and we're going to talk about what a tachypone is, there's combo pills, so you just to reduce that pill burden, like Stilevo. There's um, versions for people who have trouble swallowing or um, Interestingly, um, this one doesn't have the yellow dye that some people are allergic to, so we sometimes use that, is Parcopa. Um, so that just dissolves in the mouth, works the same as essentially the cinnamon. Um, and then um, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about the Embresia later, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about these newer ones that are coming out um, or have just come out. Um, one question that I always have with um, early, um, early in the disease process before we started medications is patients have a fear of starting medication. Do, should I, like, there's this historical thought that um, we should delay starting levodopa. But really that's actually a historical misconception um, that once they started doing more and more studies, we had a better understanding that you really, there's no need to delay, that the, there used to be this thought that the medication would eventually cause dyskinesias. But what's actually happening is patients are going to develop dyskinesias as their disease progresses. It's just about the disease progression. It's not about the medication. So if you look at this, um, this, is an, this is a study that looked at um, patients who, you can see the red line is essentially when they started levodopa um, compared to Ghanans who in general, Africa has less um, availability of medication. In general, they started having off times and dyskinesia that wasn't statistically significantly different. So they all developed dyskinesias based on when their disease started, if that makes sense. So it was more about disease duration and less about that starting time of the medication. So um, this is just another way of looking at that is that your threshold gets thinner as you go farther along in the disease, which is why those dyskinesias pop up. It's not the actual med doing it, even though it's the med that causes dyskinesias, it has nothing to do with like uh, having so much levodopa over so many years. Um, 
So I kind of talked about the uh, the uh, Raitari already. Um, so this is just essentially, if you look at it, there's a lot of graphs in here. I mean, we don't have to go too detailed into that. Oopsies. Um, so this is ours. So this line here is the Raitari. So you can see it lasts a little bit longer. Um, and then um, essentially they have, um, where is the, yeah, I'm trying to see the difference here, um, has a little bit um, more of an effect too. So it's just as effective and lasts longer. This is the Raitari, that capsule one that lasts longer. Um, and then this is hot off the presses. This just got FDA approval like less than a month ago, I think. Um, it's called Divi. Um, so um, I guess I got FDA approved in 2021, but it really hasn't been available since about a month ago. Um, so this one, um, I don't know, everybody deals with like having to break pills all the time. This one is supposed to be a little bit easier. As you can see, it's it's got little peaks and valleys so that you can kind of with your fingernail pop it um, so that you can actually split it into quarters. So if people are really, really sensitive and need just that touch more, this is supposed to provide that a little bit easier because the usual cinemat, you can split it in half, but once you start trying to split into quarters, it kind of just crumbles into pieces. It's pretty hard. So this is supposed to be a little bit easier. It's no different than cinemat when it comes to side effects or how it works. It's just literally a different packaging. Um, and then there's Inbresia, and um, we actually have our um, in, like our Inbresia set up in the back for anybody who's here in person who wants to actually um, see how it physically works, because I'm not very good at like describing it just with my hands. Um, but it's an inhaled levodopa. So um, in this way, it um, doesn't have to go through the GI system, because if you think about it, you take a pill, any medication, has to go through the esophagus, has to sit there in the stomach, has to be broken down, has to be absorbed, and then you have an effect. So generally with Cinemat, we see 30 to 40 minutes, but oftentimes people, some people with Parkinson's develop what's called gastroparesis or delayed um, colonic movement. Um, so things don't move as fast and therefore things don't get absorbed. Um, and so sometimes people will say, my medication doesn't kick in for a whole hour. And that's really, really tough when I'm sitting here just feeling frozen. Um, so this is, um, bypasses all of that and it's an inhaler um, so it goes through the lungs um, bypassing that absorption because the lungs um, are actually a very very fast way um, to get into the brain um, because there's the blood vessels that sit right next to your lungs that bring you the oxygen and everything that keeps you living um, through so it goes in much faster um, so this is generally taken as needed. Um, we generally say up to four to five times a day. Um, so it doesn't replace the, um, the treatment that we have, but for people who really have that delayed um, onset, or I actually often see it for um, patients who have their PD boxing class coming up and they're like, nothing's kicking in and I really wanna be in this class and I have this specific time. I can take this inhaler 10 minutes before class starts and I can start feeling those effects. Um, so uh, people who like to exercise a lot, I, I often use it in that kind of way too. Um, similarly, there's a little bit of a nausea, generally less so than with Cinemat because you're not going through the GI. Um, some people, when they first have it, they can have a little bit of a cough. Um, very, there is the risk of upper respiratory infection. Um, and then there's a change in saliva color, but it's not dangerous in any way. Um, so um, this just shows um, essentially that an inhaler, um, the change in their score, we, you know, we talk in numbers to each other when we're actually doing studies. Um, so that they um, took it and within 10 minutes of the dosing, you can see this drop off here and really in effect 20 minutes and lasts about an hour. Um, so that's kind of from the pill standpoint. And then there's um, the carbidopa levodopa enteral suspension called Duopa. Um, so this is FDA approved. Um, it is a pump. Um, that actually, instead of a pill, you get your levodopa in a gel um, and it goes directly into the intestine. So this does involve a surgery um, to create a G-tube. So a little tube that goes right into the uh, stomach. I think I have a picture, let me see. Yeah, um, so it goes right into the stomach. You can see it's just a little, little puncture hole there. And then um, you, you 
carry around your little pump um, and this provides the gel so it's a continuous use of the carbidopa levodopa so instead of getting the pills that go like this it's supposed to really really smooth that out um, so they had um, in general more on time compared to cinnamon when they did studies um, obviously the side effects are you have a tube in your stomach um, and so you can get tube complications things get kinked things get blocked off Really, it's not supposed to be putting anything else in, so generally the gel's not too much of an issue. Um, you can get in, if you're not cleaning it, there can be an infection around the stoma. And sometimes people still feel nausea because it is still the medication going through the GI, it's just in a different form. Am I going too fast for everybody or is this okay? Too slow? Just right? Okay. Um, this one is in research, so but should be coming out worth thinking as long as phase studies go okay. Um, there's something called, the, the name, the um, company name is Neuroderm. It's subcutaneous carbidopa levodopa. So if anybody knows um, somebody um, or they themselves have diabetes and they use an insulin pump, um, this is, I like to think, is kind of equivalent to that. So it actually, you're getting the levodopa, instead of getting all the way into the stomach, this actually goes through the fat and then it gets absorbed from your fat muscles into your system up to the brain. And again, it's supposed to be this continuous release. Um, so right now it's in phase three, there's like phase one through four for trials, right? Um, so it's in phase three, it's coming down the pipeline. Um, main side effects that they're seeing thus far are infusion site infections and like these little nodules that kind of develop, like, like the skin just kind of gets tough there. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens there, but I just kind of up, up and coming, keep an eye out for it. Mm -hmm we'll let you know, your doctors will let you know, but if they don't, did you know, something to keep an eye out for. Okay, now we're gonna switch. So that's all the levodopa. That was all just essentially the same medication in various different ways to get it into your system. These medications work in different ways. Um, again, to increase on time. It's all about increasing on time. Um, so. So we talked about levodopa, which comes onto those dopamine receptors. It is, levodopa is dopamine, once it gets into your system, comes and attaches to the dopamine receptors. Dopamine agonists are like dopamine, but they're like slightly altered chemicals, and they come and attach onto the dopamine receptors as well. So they're kind of bypassing the actual dopamine and mimicking dopamine and activating those receptors. Um, so um, there's a lot of advantages. They generally, you don't have to, because dopamine, you have to sit there and take it three, four, or five times a day. In general, a lot of these, you don't have to take as often. They last a little bit longer in the system. Um, there's there's uh, less interference. We didn't talk about this, but as many of you know, levodopa often, um, you have to watch what you eat. You can't have it with protein because of absorption issues. Um, there's generally less interference with that with these medications. Um, and some of these are like once a day dosing. Um, a lot of them have the same side effects. Um, a lot of people have leg swelling, which can be really bothersome. Um, they can have what's called sleep attacks. So we always counsel people about this if they're driving long distances or driving still. Um, they also can cause low blood pressure, just like Cinemet. Um, And then the one that I always really make sure that people know about or at least let their family members know about is impulse control issues. Um, these medications, if you think about, you know, we always talk about dopamine hits, like you go to the, you go to the casino and you get that dopamine hit. Um, so that's kind of what this is doing and it can drive people into those kinds of activities more. So um, people all of a sudden is buying scratch cards or going to the casino more often or going on, on Amazon spending sprees can be really damaging. It's a small subset, but it's something I always make sure people know about. And sometimes a patient doesn't know that they're doing it, so family members should be counseled on this. Um, so we will get, I think I will talk about, yeah, let me just mention, um, most of them are pills, but um, the Nupro um, patch is actually a patch. It's a once a day patch that um, is an alternative, again, for people who have difficulty swallowing or have difficulty with absorption issues, just gets put on. Um, generally people like, they might have, if they're like sensitive to band-aids and stuff like that, we have different ways of helping them manage that. Um, but that's a, a non-oral option of one of these. Um, 
So um, another one that is essentially like it's non-oral in the sense that you don't have to swallow is the sublingual apomorphine, which is a new, newer medication, Kinmobi. Um, it is a dopamine agonist, just as we've been talking about. It's not morphine. Um, I, it's just a terrible choice of name. <laughs> so it has nothing to do with morphine. Um, it is a dopamine agonist. Um, so it's been FDA approved for a couple of um, years. Um, again, this is kind of one of those things that's an adjunct um, for off, sudden off times. People um, who have these unpredictable off times, they can pop this, goes into the system much faster because if you put it under the tongue, there's a lot of little blood um, vessels that live there that it can get right to the brain pretty quickly. Um, you can take it kind of like Umbresia up to four to five times a day. Again, does not replace the medications they're on. Um, but um, some people will have like ickiness with the tongue component. It does cause um, nausea a little bit more than um, the others. Um, again, can cause a sleepiness and some people feel dizzy on it as well. Um, because of the nausea, generally people um, need to do um, pre-treatment um, and there is, they have to have their um, heart monitored for the first treatment because some people with first dose had some issues with that. But after that, as long as your system shows that it's not gonna have that issue, you don't um, have to um, do that. It's just for the first time. So you do have to come into the clinic for the first dose and be monitored. Um, anytime that the dose is escalated, as you can see, there's several different levels. You would have to repeat that process. Um, okay, so then another group. These are the comp T inhibitors. Um, so then, so let's be, so we talked about levodopa coming into the brain. Um, and then we have dopamine agonists that are kind of mimickers that come in and hit those receptors. But sometimes what you want is that you get the dopamine in there and it just gets broken down and sucked back up and it's just not staying in the system long enough. And so the COMT inhibitors help things just chill out there. Um, so essentially there's enzymes that come in and break up all the chemicals in your brain all the time. There's little enzymes making things breaking down. These block those enzymes from working. So things can just kind of sit in there and attach to receptors longer, float in that pool, as you could say. So it de decre these are helpful for decreasing off time and prolonging on time. I call them kind of those that like extra juice. So you get a little bit higher of an on time, but it's really about, let's say you're not, you're, you're running out of steam about an hour before that next dose of the Cinemat. This is a good medication to add on to kind of boost those on time. The average is 41 minutes additional of on time for each dose. Uh, and Tacopone is the classic one. You have to take it with each dose of the Cinemat, which I said does come in a combo pill called Stilevo. Um, but there is um, a new one, um, which I actually didn't even put on here, my bad, um, called a Picapone. And a Picapone is right off the market too right now, and it's just a once a day dosing, just like in Tacapone, but it's once a day dosing. Um, side effects, um, some people have bothersome diarrhea. There is a urine discoloration which people panic about. It is nothing, you don't have to worry about it, it just changes the color of the urine. Um, Tolcapone did have some um, evidence of liver damage. We, it's not really available anymore. Um, and sometimes people, because it's that little booster, it's that little extra juice in your engine, um, will have increased peak dose effects on this. Again, like that dyskinesia, is that feeling too on? Oh, I did talk about Picapone. Okay, sorry, I didn't remember if I put this in there. So this, um, again, is just, it's like in Tacapone, but it's once daily, and overall increases the on time by about an hour per day total. Um, so again, just to, trying to smooth out that time that you're on. Um, this one, um, people do say they have some dizziness and occasionally dry mouth, which can be like managed by drinking more water, which I always tell everybody to do anyway. Um, so um, just like the COMT inhibitors, there's the MAO inhibitors, um, which also stop breakdown of doping in the brain. So they just work on essentially different enzymes, but there is the same process of breaking up, reducing breaking down. Um, these can be taken alone or in combination with levodopa. So unlike the COMT, which it really are used to get, like you have to use it with the Cinemet, this is sometimes used for people who um, are just starting off. They don't really want to start Cinemet. They don't want to start three times a day dosing. They can just take this medication and it lets their natural reserve of dopamine, which is less in Parkinson's, but there's still some naturally in your system, it allows it to just sit in that pool a little bit longer. Um, so there's once or twice daily dosing. Um, sometimes people often have a lot of like help with it from a fatigue standpoint because, um, 
I don't know if you can read this, maybe the people on the computer can. Um, this is the breakdown of the drug into amphetamine. Anybody know what amphetamine is? So um, it's kind of like, it's meth, <laughs> so it's not exactly, but it's like, it's in the meth family. So it's that like kind of activating, um, very similar to what people use um, like for Ritalin and things like that. It's it's an activating kind of boost people's energy. Um, again, it's it's not addictive. It doesn't work like that, but we really recommend people don't take it at night because then they have a lot of insomnia. It's a morning dose kind of medication. Um, Sometimes people, when they first start it, can kind of feel fluey with it as they get used, but that generally gets better as they get used to it, as well as the joint pains um, is kind of a rare side effect. Um, and some people will have blood pressure changes with it, kind of fluctuations in their blood pressure. So got to keep an eye on that. Um, so this one is kind of a mix uh, methods um, medication. It works, part of it, it works on as those MAOB inhibitors that we just talked about here. Um, but it has multiple modes of action. It's kind of hit in different places. Um, this is also used to um, decrease off time. Um, it's once daily dosing. Um, it may have an impact on dyskinesia reduction. So some people use it for that to try and reduce dyskinesia. Um, again, I won't get onto all the chemicals from that. Um, and it may have some help with pain. Um, again, this is all just based off of what the studies did. Um, so it's like plus minus if people actually experience that. Um, but people do still, because it's essentially creating more on time, they can still um, experience dyskinesias. Um, it did also show that there was a potential for increased falls, which we always get very concerned about. Um, I'll kind of skip that in the, in the sense of time here. Um, and um, then there's essentially, so we talked about dopamine receptors. Um, there's the brain, as we all know, is a very complex system, and there's a lot of different chemicals working on a lot of different receptors that come into how Parkinson's affects the system. And one of them is the NMDA receptor. Um, and so there is medications that we find actually help symptoms um, that actually don't aren't directly in the dopamine pathway, but do have an important effect in the Parkinson's experience. And the, an amantadine is an antagonist, so it essentially um, blocks this receptor from working, which we often find people find is um, helpful for some people use it to treat the actual Parkinson symptoms. But I would say in general, what we use it mostly for is for dyskinesia reduction. So people are on Cinemat or people are on their various different levodopa medications. They start experiencing dyskinesias. This is that add on to fight dyskinesias. And in general, we do see, maybe I talk about it here. Um, no. Um, we do see that it reduces those dyskinesias uh, pretty significantly for a lot of people. You take it two or three times a day if it's amantadine. Um, in general, we use the amantadine. There's the once daily, daily Osmolex, um, which is an extended release. The nice thing about this medication is it comes in a liquid form, which most of our other, like the Cinemet Levodopa, don't, none of the things I really talked about other than the patches and stuff um, come in a liquid form. This one's just nice because some people just find it's difficult to swallow. Um, it just a caution. If you have kidney issues, this needs to be like brought up with your doctor. Um, they should know about that, but just remind them, um, it has to be cautious and might have to change dosing if kidney de issues develop. Um, it doesn't cause kidney issues. It just affects like how much you can take. Um, Problem is that some people will feel that this affects their cognition, um, that it can cause a little bit of confusion, um, can also uh, worsen, therefore, hallucinations. Um, so we have to be pretty cautious with that. The one thing I want to bring up, because there's this weird word that I have here called levito reticularis, which some of you may be familiar with, um, but most people aren't, because if you don't experience it, it's kind of bizarre. Um, it uh, essentially means like lacy skin. It's this weird... Um, pattern that comes up on the legs that sometimes it's not necessarily painful or anything it's just particularly bothersome it can be profoundly discoloring um so people need to be um told that this may happen and to the point that some people don't want to take it because of it um it's but it's um it's something that people just kind of get panicked because they think they're like losing blood supply that's not what's happening it's just a weird rash um, and then Gocovery is essentially the extended release version of it. You only have to take it once. 
Um, so some people, again, who have troubles taking things multiple times, there's an extended release version of it. Um, but similarly, it works the same way. Um, and then this is a fairly new medication. Um, again, this is an add-on medication, does not replace um, the overall dopamine treatment, um, but um, essentially acts actually on the caffeine pathway, um, which is all wrapped up in uh, Parkinson's as well. And this reduces um, off time. Uh, it um, can be particularly helpful um, with tremor. Um, but similarly has a lot of the same side effects of all of our medications, lightheadedness, nausea, and then because you're reducing those off times, you're boosting people into on times dyskinesias. But um, they did find that in general, they were a little bit less of those bothersome dyskinesias. They were more of those non-bothersome people just feeling like they can dance, they can move. Um, so that's kind of a summary of all of them, everything that I talked about. Um, so like I said, there's we talked about our dopamine. We have, and that's our again our base of our pyramid. And sometimes if things have sudden offs, I'm just kind of going to go over all of this sudden offs or not lasting long enough and just need rescue based on what you're doing that day. We have the Embresia and we have the Kinmobi. Um, there's the new Levodopa styles with the Ritari, which is those capsules that are more smoothing effect, less fluctuation. Um, Duopa, which is the um, pump so that it doesn't go through the mouth. Um, and then Divi's that brand new one for um, smaller breaking of doses if you need to take tiny doses um, more easier than using a pill cutter. Um, and then we have the newer um, MAOB inhibitor, which is the Zidagio, or Zidago, I can never pronounce it right. Um, but it might have a little bit more anti-dyskinetic effect. Um, and then we have Opicapone, which is that, again, add-on medication, you only have to take it once a day, um, increases on time, increases the length of your doses of your dopamine. And then that totally new mechanism of the Nurians, again, it reduces that off time, but it doesn't replace um, your basic medications. So then what's in the pipeline? Um, so, you know, I think oftentimes I see this in the clinic, people are kind of just, you know, they're like, what's coming up? What's, you know, I want something that's disease modifying. I want, what, what I mean by that is slowing the progression of the disease because I didn't mention this before, but all of these medications don't change the progression of the disease. They treat symptoms. And the big thing that we're all looking for is something that slows the progression of the disease. Some medication we can give to our patients early on in their disease that's gonna make for a slower progression into falls, progression into bothersome stiffness and worsening tremors and things. Um, and we're actively working on it. Everybody, that is the big thing that we're all working on. And all there's, you know, Parkinson's Foundation and Michael J. Fox and all of those groups are, are putting a lot of resources into that. And things come down the pipeline, but the way research is, if anybody's a scientist, you have hypotheses, and sometimes your hypotheses aren't right when you actually put it into um, the system. So we've had some recent setbacks um, that, that people have been looking at that ended up not really panning out, but we have over 142 studies um, currently in those phase one through three trials. Like I said, there's four phases of trial before things get on the market. There's a lot going on still. And so that's like part of our job as doctors is to keep up with this. You can't just go to med school and learn these things and say goodbye to research or studying. You have to keep up with these because these things are ongoing and there's always gonna be something new down the pipeline. And my big hope is that we do have something disease modifying down the pipeline. There's probably the biggest frontier that we have is gene targeting therapies. Um, if you think about it, so little little lesson, not everybody that has Parkinson's has a genetic cause, but what we're finding is there's multiple genes that increase your risk of Parkinson's. And some of those genes have specific enzymes that we know have like a really high risk of, in, of, of creating Parkinson's. Um, so it doesn't mean that everybody who has this gene is gonna get Parkinson's, but we see it much more commonly in our Parkinson's population. And if there are specific genes and specific enzymes, it's much easier to make a drug targeting something that we know causes a disease. So that's the whole idea is learning more of who has this and can we make a drug targeted towards those patients in specific. Um, oopsies, oh, there we go. Okay, um, 
so I, I do this as a little plug and we're going to talk about research down the line, but there's more and more push for our patients to get genetic testing so we know who has these genes. Um, not Again, not everybody has this, but it's going to be really important because those patients that do have those genetic um, mutations are going to be the ones that are probably pushed um, to be a part of gene modifying therapy research in the future. Um, we do have two D disease modifying drugs in phase three trials right now. So they're trying to figure out if this actually changes disease um, length course. Um, if you think about it though, all of this is so slow moving because Parkinson's is slow moving. So for us to have an understanding if something makes a difference, you have to follow patients five, 10, 15 years down the line. And so anytime you come up with a hypothesis, you're looking at some people's whole careers um, looking at a, a specific molecule or a specific drug. Um, so that's why this is kind of slow process and it can be very frustrating. Um, there's tons of, again, hypothesis all over the place. This is what we have actually going, all the different chemicals that people are looking at. Um, the top being all the disease modifying and then um, just a ton of symptomatic therapies for, you know, helping people, even if we don't find that disease modifying right now, making feel, people feel more comfortable and less symptomatic. Um, so I always kind of do a couple plugs, recommendations for your visit. As I talked about, we do have to know about all the different medications that are people taking. It's really nice to list them out. All of our meds, a lot of our patients are taking meds multiple times a day. And because a lot of these are about reducing off times or reduce wearing off, it's really helpful for us as doctors to know exactly when you're taking your meds so that we can say, okay, you need a little bit more help in the afternoon. You need a little bit of help right when you get up in the morning. How can we do that? So it's really helpful to have it updated and what the doses are. Um, and then also keeping a list of all those, as you can see, we have a lot of different meds and people get side effects and don't tolerate things. Um, making sure you have a list, even if it doesn't count as an allergy, because the system has your allergies in, but it's, it doesn't necessarily say, oh, you know, I felt a little nauseous when I took that, or that really worsened my hallucinations. That's not necessarily going to be in there. So it's really helpful to keep a little tab on that of all the medications that you've tried, especially if you're switching doctors. But finally, and I heard everybody talking about boxing, so I'm gonna plug it. Um, exercise is the best treatment we have for Parkinson's still. All of our, our medications are to help you feel more on so that you can exercise, because exercise is the only thing that we know that slows the progression of the disease. So I wanna keep my patients on their feet. I wanna keep them going to those PD boxing classes, swimming if they like to, getting on that stationary bike when it's freezing out, though today's lovely, so everybody should try and take a walk. Um, so that's that's really, I want the medications to help you help yourself by being active. So that's kind of my spiel on medications. I wanted to stop and give time for questions and then do the research update, because I think we're, yeah, we're doing pretty good on time. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you guys have any questions as well right now. Let's see. While she's doing that, anybody have questions? Yes. I, I always have an infinite number of questions. So. Absolutely. I'm sure other people are thinking of it. So, um, okay. so first one, okay. one comment on your recommendation for the medication lists. Mm -hmm. um, everybody and or their care partner to take ownership in double checking what else you're being prescribed and the potential interactions. Because I've had multiple times where I get, you know, you know I went in for knee surgery and I got prescribed something from the mm -hmm. surgeon that was yeah. counter contraindicated. I find that medical offices actually do not do a very great job of cross-checking all those lists with all the contraindications. That's just a heads up for people. It's part of Parkinson's in general is taking ownership of, of your well being. And that's one example of where you can be directly involved in making sure that you're, you're not being let down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. um, and then a, a general question on medication. Mm -hmm. um, so, a lot of 
you know, a lot of new medications come out. Mm -hmm. If you're skeptical about the pharmacy industry, you suspect that maybe they're just looking for things that are on patents so they can charge more money. And so, how good a job do you think? Well, I'm not going to try to break it, but, um, you know, so residualine versus selegiline, mm -hmm. they're basically they're both in the OP inhibitor, but Azalec came out. And as far as I know, everybody switched to Azalec, you know, it was like a thousand dollars a month, mm -hmm. and the selegiline was two dollars a month. Mm -hmm. You know, my physician recommended go recovery at three thousand dollars a month, not covered by, by insurance, instead of starting with an at like five bucks a month. Right, right. Um, so, how much do you think? Both the industry and the physicians just migrate to the new thing because it's new, mm -hmm. as opposed to really looking at the trade offs and the enhanced capability of reduced side effects. Right. I, I think that brings up a really good thing that I, I yes, and I didn't really touch on that, but um, that is very important for the physician to think about and the patient to think about when these discussions are happening in the clinic before actually prescribing anything, because cost is a huge part of medical care. Um, and I think, I think there is, there's a flavor of that. It depends on your physician and, and how they kind of, um, like to go forward because if it's if it's new it's been it has been fda approved it has been shown effective but there is the balance of the quality of life and that you need to be able to afford these medications if they're actually going to work for you um so i think um i always take into account looking you know most medical emrs have patients insurance and once you get into a practice long enough you start knowing what is not or not is and is not going to be covered um and so um, I do take that into account, but I also always bring it up with the patient. And I think that is also something, um, like you said, of kind of the taking ownership of just being like very open with your doctor and saying like, is this gonna, what is this gonna cost me? They may not know exactly how much it's gonna cost, but generally things that are on patent are gonna be more expensive. Um, that saying, I don't, I'm on a fixed income. I don't think I'm gonna be able to afford this. It's better to say that upfront before we go down the route and you take medication and you're like wow this works really well and then we can't get it for you um i will say to some degree um there are patient assistance programs we do have um, depending on where you go there is like social worker assistance um that can help with coverage for things that we do know are actually like particularly beneficial with improving quality of life but is still um not generic um so always ask is there any assistance program um that can be of this, for this particular med um but i think that's a really good point to bring up yeah and with all, all due respect i wouldn't have too much trouble here but um patient assistance program you also probably want to make sure you understand how long it lasts yes because here let me give you a free sample for a month or for a couple of months and then you find out all this works really well, and you find out all this is really expensive. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, you know, one thing I told people is that pharmaceutical companies are like drug dealers. In fact, actually, they are drug dealers. I mean, that, that's an exaggeration, but um, but yeah, making sure you understand the whole picture is really important. And um, oftentimes I do say, so you look at patient assistance programs, but also um, sometimes um, ask to send the medication and then call your insurance and say how much, if I were to pay out of pocket for this, like one, is it covered? And if it isn't, if what would it be for out of pocket? Because yes, if you do get a month's supply or anything, you're gonna wanna know what things are gonna look like down the pipeline. And generally going through the insurance company is the best bet because it does get, very much in the weeds, um, especially with all the different Medicare supplements that people can have. I don't know those um, by heart. Um, so generally getting that number on the back of your card is really beneficial. Yes. Is it common to take medication for several different categories that you've been listed? Is it common to take it in multiple medication, in multiple categories? Absolutely. Um, generally that's what we're doing. Like I talked about kind of those we're finding that having kind of this 
poly, I, I don't like the term polypharmacy because that sounds bad because we don't want that, but having um, a regimen hitting various different areas and working with each other um, is very common. Um, it doesn't necessarily happen at the beginning of the disease when things are pretty simple, doses are pretty basic. This is those things as things get further along and progression happens, we have more off time, we have more fluctuations. We start adding, a, we start adding potentially a comp T inhibitor to make things last longer. Um, maybe they need that patch to kind of smooth everything out for those fluctuations. Um, maybe the dyskinesias, they're gonna come out later on in the disease, the amantatine or something like that that reduces dyskinesias is gonna be added on. It's very common for my patients to be on three, four, five different types of medications. And it is very complicated. And I would say something that I find, I ask all patients, um, not all of us are like totally in tune with, um, with technology, but I think most phones nowadays have an alarm on them. Setting an alarm to remember to take medications, being on time with your medications can be some of the most beneficial. I've had people who say they're off all the time. And once I actually just get them on an alarm system, they're having a much better day. Um, but it does get complicated writing it out. If people like Excel or just want to use a little, a lot of people just like a little journal, write things down, keep a little spreadsheet um, because it does get complicated. We were talking about some people um, say, well, I don't want to get on the medications because they wear out. You know, like it's not true, but now we know that's not true. But it seems like um, most people are starting to write out on how to go through it. And I was wondering why they don't go through the comp, you know, the, comp the different ones. Reuptake first. Yeah. Um, so some people do, um, if they're really, so again, like levodopa is kind of that base of that pyramid in general, everybody's going to eventually be on some iteration of it. Um, and in general, it's, it's, it's generally well tolerated. It's generic, you know, it's very easy to get people on that. Um, but some people will start off with a dopamine agonist first. Um, uh, and then, um, or they can be on like the MLB inhibitors, but some of these, like that COMP-T inhibitor types, um, so like the intacopone and the opicopone, don't do anything unless you have levodopa. So some of them are very much like that adjunct medication. Um, so it is just kind of the flavor of, it's that shared decision-making with your doctor on saying, these are the side effects that I'm worried about. These are, this is my lifestyle. I don't want to be, maybe I don't want to be taking medications three or four times a day. Let's start something with once or twice a day dosing that may not be as effective, but can give me that little bit of boost. That's all I need right now. So um, sometimes we see people that hold off on the levodopa, mostly just from like a dosing side, side of things that they just don't want to be taking the med yet. Um, but eventually it is the one that people are going to be on. It seems like what I'm thinking that they actually use Cinemac to, to diagnose and pattern. Right. And that's a really good point. So that's kind of something that we utilize. If, you know, some patients you come in and it's like slam dunk, very easy to diagnose. But if there's like little things where you're like, I'm not really sure, it can be helpful. It's, it's not a diagnostic criteria, I should say, but it can be really helpful to say, like, are we dealing with dopamine? a dopamine depleted situation here. If you have a response to the medication, that's a very good, that's extremely good evidence that we're dealing with Parkinson's. I will say there is a very, very small percentage of patients who are not dopamine responsive, and we're talking in the single digits. Um, and in general, I we do see a lot of patients who say, I'm not levodopa responsive. And it generally, once you dig in, it's when they're taking the medications, they have absorption issues, they're not taking enough. So like they got diagnosed later in their disease and they were started on a starting dose, but their system is at a point where they need much more medications. Um, so we generally do a levodopa trial, um, generally much higher doses than what starting doses to verify if people are actually responsive. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna throw in a plug, um, so uh, Dr. Heider is in a, a fellowship program to become a little disorder specialist. Um, because these things are so complicated, there's so many interactions. Having a human disorder specialist is 
highly recommended over a general neurologist. You're going to get a general neurologist who swears they're really interested in Parkinson's. Um, but uh, you know, that's one thing that I was diagnosed 15 years ago, and that's I think the multiple doctors and constantly searching for ones who are good to know what's going on. Um, because you do get into the you know, multiple dangers of mm -hmm. uh, you take a drug and it has a side effect, and then they give you a drug for the side effect of that, and then that has another side effect, they give you a drug for the side effect of that, and it's this cascade of yeah. eight or ten drugs that are all interacting in strange ways. And um, the national, our national groups, our national neurology groups do recommend that any every Parkinson's patient um, see a Parkinson's specialist, somebody who's had training for movement disorders, at least annually. It's not feasible for people to come down to Denver, as we all know. Um, we have plenty of people here on the call that I know you're even farther away. Um, so sometimes it's that shared um, care with that local neurologist, but to make sure everything's kind of teed up or that they then have that communication line that they can talk to the Parkinson specialists. Um, and, you know, at least annually, somebody coming in and kind of making sure that things are teed up. Yeah. But the problem with that in frontier medicine, I'm glad that you're interested in that, is like in the whole state of Wyoming, we do not have even one movement disorders specialist. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's always something that you're, I mean, I know a lot of people that don't have the thing, but general physicians, which are still here in, in Wyoming, mm -hmm. that are treating them. And, yeah. Right. They don't even have a neurologist, right. maybe. So, yeah. Yeah. So, and it's, it's, an issue we have throughout the country. I come from the Midwest and my, my family is in areas that the closest movement disorder is about an eight hour drive. Um, so it's a huge issue and something I'm kind of interested, in, but a lot of it comes with, um, you know, there's the, and this is just kind of getting into thoughts, but like telemedicine could be particularly helpful, but it needs to be that you can practice over state lines. Um, and that needs to be changed um but that's you know we're we're in the again we're in the frontier of frontier medicine i think of of trying to figure out how to do this appropriately oh i have two questions so you have one right there okay and then you have someone with their hand raised. oh their hand raised how do they how do i ask we can them? call on them so Chris. oh okay cool well i'll ask the question that's in the thing right now you mentioned a caffeine pathway in parkinson's can you talk some more about that yeah um, so um, the caffeine, so I should say there is natural, uh, caffeine is like, or caffeine works on receptors that are naturally found in your brain. Um, and interestingly, um, patients who um, have Parkinson's um, tend to, I, th I believe it's like they need more, like they don't have as much of a response to coffee. They need more caffeine. So there is something that we have an understanding that it is, that it is affect that pathway in some way whether a lack of receptors as well. Um, and so don't treat your Parkinson's with coffee <laughs> is my main takeaway. I, so thanks for bringing that up. Um, it's You're going to have a lot more side effects from that um, than actually getting anything beneficial off of it. Um, and then let me see how I ask Chris. Maybe I unmute. Yeah, I think I unmute Chris. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you for putting this on today. It's uh, it's been very uh, informative. Of course. Of course. Uh, I had a question. Um, I actually uh, I um, I was um, diagnosed with Parkinson's about four years ago, and uh, I go to the movement disorder clinic at Swedish down in Denver with Dr. Kumar, mm -hmm. and with him I've been on. Um, I'm actually on a clinical trial right now that is is more of a uh, home monitoring type device, but before that it was on the uh, Biogen, uh, a very large clinical trial. Uh, of course, they were looking at the antigen um, approach to it, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, they uh, I, I I was on that for two and a half years. Um, so it was it was pretty interesting, and uh, I think like many Parkinson's patients out there, it is such a slow progressing disease. Anything that we can do as lab rats to bring more information and quicker to um, those that uh, have this uh, 
this disease, uh, we're uh, very um, happy to do so. And I thank you so much. Any involvement in research clinics is such a gift to the scientific community and the Parkinson's community at large. Yeah, it's great. Um, and and I, I never pay for my visits. <laughs> you know, I, Absolutely. I can, something to be said for trials too. Yeah, so that that always that that works great for the pocketbook, especially because I am uh, I just uh, started taking Ritary, and that is a, a very expensive medication. Uh, at, at least to me, you know, I don't. It's it's, it's about a thousand bucks a month, um, mm -hmm. so it's pretty pricey. But uh, one of the things I was just curious about, uh, I've read the Tony Robbins book that's uh, probably getting a lot of press these days. And in his book, he mentions the uh, precision ultrasound. Do you know anything about that? Oh, yes. So, um, you know, this focus was on medications. My talk was on medication because we could have very much another entire talk on our advanced therapies. Um, and um, I should say um, surgery and um, interventions. Um, mm -hmm. So I believe you're talking about the focused ultrasound. Yes. Uh, yes. So the focused ultrasound um, has uh, recently been, I should say it's been approved for a couple of years. We actually just got the machine and the we've got it up started um, at the movement disorders um, clinic at University of Colorado with our neurosurgeons. It's a, you know, it's, it's a combination of um, care with the neurologists and the neurosurgeons. Um, and I have to talk about DBS if I'm going to talk about focused ultrasound. Um, mm -hmm. DBS the deep brain stimulation that I'm sure many people have heard about. Um, again, that was not the focus of my st my study because, um, you know, in general, we start with medications and when medications don't work or there's too many side effects um, or there's too many fluctuations, um, you know, various different reasons from that standpoint, we start talking about those advanced therapies. And deep brain stimulation is, um, in which you put leads actually into the areas that are affected into the deep brain. Um, and um, you have leads in there, they come down, they attach to a little battery, and your doctor can sit and program stimulation into those regions um, that essentially does what the drugs were doing. So improving stiffness, slowness, tremor. Um, now, there's a very extensive workup for that, and not everybody is a candidate for deep brain stimulation. And some people don't like the idea of actual brain surgery. Um, so there's various different reasons that people don't go down that route when they are finding that medications aren't doing the job. And focused ultrasound um, is, um, and I'll, I, I would say an alternative that's good for certain categories of people who are ultimately deemed not to be DBS candidates or do not want surgery. Um, because there's actually no incision that takes place. I'm always hesitant to not call it a surgery because it still involves actually burning a portion of the brain, affecting a portion of the brain. So it is actually like an intervention. Um, and it is, um, it's um, useful for people who are tremor predominant because it really is only going to help tremor. It doesn't help the other Sim, sim, motor symptoms of Parkinson's. But some people say, I don't have slowness. I don't have problems with my gait. I don't have any of that. It's just this tremor. I, the tremor gets in the way of everything. That's what they want to focus on. Focused ultrasound can do that. The other thing about focused ultrasound it is it's only approved one-sided. So it's really good for people who are particularly asymmetric, meaning they only are affected on one side, or they're saying, gets in the way of me writing. I'm right-handed. Let's take care of that. Um, it also has various different things that you have to go through, um, a workup to make sure you're um, a candidate. Um, there's various different things that affect it. Um, I will say you also have to shave your head. Um, so that actually does affect some people that really don't want to do that. Um, but um, in general, it's just a one and done thing, um, as opposed to DBS where you come back and you do um, programming and you have your battery that you have to keep an eye on. Um, so essentially it's ultrasound, just like you know, people get echoes of their heart, people take a look at babies through ultrasound. If you take it, and that's like very, very safe, like that doesn't do anything to your body in any way, right? It's not radiation. But there's specific things you can do with ultrasound um, in which when it's focused like that, you can actually heat up a portion of tissue. So if you take ultrasound beams from various different angles, 
and you focus like a, um, oh, I really like the way one of my attendings called it. Like um, when people have a, um, like on a sunny day like this, um, what is, um, uh, a magnifying glass to ants, right? You can focus that beam in. So what they're doing is focusing something like light, that's not natu naturally anything gonna burn anything, and focus it in, it burns that little part of the brain. So you do make a little hole in the brain, um, the tremor driving portion of it. Um, and that's why we only do it one-sided. So does that answer your question? Yes, no, that was uh, very good. Um, I think I'm a perfect candidate for it because all of the things you described uh, as being a good candidate, I would be, I have heard that um, it's not, it, it uh, after a, a, a period of time, I don't know if it's, you know, like two or three years or something, the tremors do seem to come back. So it's not a cure, but it's, uh, it's a, a, you know, a, a, a brief period, well, a, a few years of, of um, uh, you know, not having to deal okay. with the tremors. Yeah, and it, it has been shown it can last longer. It just depends on, again, anatomy and exactly how it went. Um, it also depends, we, you, you, there's, it's that portion of the brain, when you get that deep, you have to be very, very careful of where you're going because there's very important areas around it that you really don't want to burn. Um, so sometimes it, it just, it depends on, um, what they're able to do when they're actually in the surgery um, to get that benefit. Um, and so I always I always caveat all of this, all of this, all medication, everything like that. None of this is to get rid of the symptoms. It's to reduce the symptoms to a point that you can, as you had just kind of mentioned, at least get some improvement in that quality of life. Great, well, thank you. Yeah. And then... Thank you so much for helping me. This is, I've never used this system before. Steve, I'm gonna stop with that questions. Okay. I'm just gonna go from the, I'm sorry, I don't know what order people have asked. Yeah, um, so I, I think we just talked to Chris. And I think Steve had his hand raised. Yeah, I think I saw a question. Sorry guys, we have to, it's a very tiny little like space <laughs> and I have to like scroll down here. <laughs> oh, okay, Kent. That was Kent's question. Oh, Kent one. answered. I, hopefully I answered your question, Kent. Krista. So we can click, click on that one to see. I think she might have typed it out. Oh, she might have typed it out. Okay, go to question pane. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. I also didn't talk about this. Um, okay, you guys are asking great questions. It's prompting me to remember all the different things that we can talk about. Um, so Krista asked, do you have any recommendations for helping foot cramps? meaning dystonia. Um, so, um, which is a good little learning point. So uh, people can experience cramps, people can experience dystonia with Parkinson's. Cramps, I always think of like Charlie horses. Everybody's kind of experienced a Charlie horse, but patients with Parkinson's can have more Charlie horses. It can be very painful. You like sleeping at night and you get woken up and it's like really tight and tense and terrible. Um, we have ways of treating that um, with, um, I mean, even tonic water can be helpful for that. Um, but dystonia, so dystonia is um, something that you don't have to have Parkinson's to experience dystonia. Um, actually, one of um, people often know people who have writer's cramp um, in which they like stop being able to write after a period of time. They kind of, their hand gets all twisted. That's a form of dystonia. So you don't have to have Parkinson's to have dystonia. But dystonia works in the path, in similar pathways as Parkinson's disease. And so we see a lot of it with our patients with Parkinson's. Classically, uh, like um, Chris had mentioned, it's in the foot or the leg, um, as opposed to various other, it can be any part of the body, but that's our classic area for Parkinson's. And so of course, Parkinson's patients have troubles walking anyway, and then all of a sudden your foot's turning in, it's pushing down, it's rubbing on the inside of your shoe, giving you blisters. Um, so classically what dystonia is, it's not necessarily a cramp like that Charlie horse, it's an over, ag over antagonism of muscles, meaning these muscles are just activating. They're not cramping up, but they're just, you know, like you, like you, you activate a muscle to do this, that muscle's just sitting there wanting to stay in that position when you're not telling it to do that. So classically, the foot likes to turn down and turn in. So you're kind of stuck like that, which nobody can walk like a ballerina all day long. 
Um, so um, some patients with dystonia um, respond really well to all of the medications that we talked about, um, levodopa. Some patients dystonia just that's how we take care of it. Some patients don't have as much response to their dystonia from that, and that our first line for that is Botox. So has anybody ever heard about Botox and Parkinson's? So we use Botox for actually a couple different things, but dystonia is one of the big ones. Um, so I always say, everybody thinks of Botox as what gets rid of your wrinkles, but we did it first. And the, the dermatologist all realized that it worked great for wrinkles, and they took it. Um, so um, it was actually first um, take, used for ophthalmologists for patients who had essentially dystonia of their eyes. So these poor people weren't actually blind, but were essentially blind because they couldn't open their eyes. They were stuck like this. And you could give Botox um, in the muscles, and um, it essentially stops muscles from working for about three months. Um, so you inject the toxin, it's a toxin made by a bacteria. We've removed the bacteria, it's now just the toxin. We inject it in, it essentially stops those muscles from working. Um, so the main side effect is weakness, but we balance it, we try and make sure that we're not giving it too much or too little. We find that Goldilocks position um, and make those those muscles that are sitting there just doing this not work for about three months so that they can open up and let the other muscles do their job and have that foot lay flat. Um, so it does involve injections. Um, and so some people get nervous about needles, but I will say we do these a lot. We do this. This is actually movement disorders is care of dystonia is a whole nother group of patients that we take care of that have dystonia from other diseases. Um, so um, that's something to talk about um, with your doctor. In general, some general neurologists will do it, but in general, you have to have training as a movement disorders doc. And unfortunately, it works pretty much only three months, so you get to come see us quite a bit for it. Um, okay. And then... Oh, here, I have another one. Are there any medications for non-motor symptoms like speech? And why is speech a non-motor symptom anyway? Um, that's a very good question. Um, so, uh, great question, Kent. Um, so speech, we kind of we kind of put in non-motor symptoms, but it really is really a motor symptom because these are all muscles. Everything here is a muscle. Um, and so speech um, can, can, it can affect muscles in various different ways. So kind of classically, we talk about something called hypophonia, meaning low voice, that soft, quiet voice. It's very difficult to understand sometimes. It can also affect the way that the, the, the um, tongue and the lips move together. Um, just like everything else kind of gets incoordinated, um, the, that area can cause a slurring of the speech. So words kind of run into them, they kind of just sound mushy. Um, and then there's the whole other big portion, um, which is um, the muscles that involve not just speech, but swallowing. And that's a big, big issue for a lot of our patients is that those aren't working together. They're not working at the speed that they're supposed to. So people can go down the wrong tube, which can be very dangerous. Um, and so um, there are not any, I should say, not any medications that direct directly towards speech, other than if you, ha again, have any response from your other medications. If some people do say they just speak clearer, they speak louder um, when they take their meds, but not everybody responds to that. Um, so our biggest thing is non-pharmacologic management of that. Um, and, I, and I really, really lean on my amazing speech pathologists um, so again, obviously they are, so, you know, there's physical therapists, there's occupational therapists, and then I think of speech therapists. They're also swallowing therapists, um, anything that's like these muscles up here. Um, so I generally direct my patients to talk with a speech therapist. Um, and in general, um, speech therapy, if you're trying to work on that hypophonia, that soft voice, um, you either have to use it or you lose it. So they'll give um, practice. And you have to stay on top of it because we see that patients just lose that unless they're doing those practices. Um, and they generally can direct you to different classes online that can help you with that. Um, I'm not gonna say that I'm a specialist in that. My, actually, my, um, my sister is a speech pathologist and she's always talking to me about all the muscles and what they're doing. And I'm like, that's great. I don't know all those muscles in that detail. They're really very good at talking to you about how to safely 
they sit there and they watch you swallow and they're like, they know exactly which muscle's not working and they can direct you on how to appropriately swallow, how to appropriately speak to work around those issues. Um, Good. Expanding on that question, mm -hmm. um, at the beginning when you listed you know, typical heart and symptoms, they were all motor symptoms. And generally speaking, I think surveys have shown that people are more bothered by the non-motor symptoms than the actual motor symptoms. Yes. So all the medications you talked about, are those all focused on motor symptoms and mm -hmm. are there any special medications for non-motor symptoms? Yeah. Um, Yes, so these are what I talked about today was, that would be another talk, um, because our non-motor um, our non-motor questionnaire is, I, I have about 20 questions I ask about non-motor symptoms. Um, and yes, it is a huge portion of the quality of life. Um, and all of our medications are focused on, today was talked about motor. Um, in general, the non-motor symptoms are, you can usually say they're they're treated the same as anybody who wouldn't have Parkinson's would have those symptoms with, in general. Um, there's definitely different caveats and different special circumstances you have to think about, but I, I could go on listing them. But a big one is constipation or GI issues, which you treat just like constipation for anybody else who would ever experience it. These medications aren't gonna touch it. They may in fact actually worsen it, some of them. Um, so, um, there's depression, anxiety, mood issues, something that we don't talk enough about, um, I think, um, and generally we treat them just like we treat depression and anxiety, though we do find certain medications are a little bit better in Parkinson's or we have to be careful with other ones. Um, there's sleep. Sleep's a huge issue. These medications can actually help with sleep depending on... I mean, sleep's a complicated thing. We spend a third of our lives doing it. And it's not just, you know, you fall asleep and you don't think about it, but your brain's doing a ton of different things. Your body's doing different things throughout this. Um, and um, there can be various different parts of Parkinson's that are that affect sleep. Um, REM behavior disorder being one of them. Not everybody with Parkinson's has that, but it's actually very common for patients to have it for a decade before they get Parkinson's, which is that dream enactment. So their bed partner's like, yeah, they're punching me every night. Um, so we have different ways of treating that. These medications generally don't touch it, but we do have ways of treating it. But one thing that these medications really do for sleep is if people are, are having bothersome pain or stiffness that constantly wakes them up, these medications can be really helpful. So it's not uncommon that even if people are like, well, I'm not walking around, why would I need meds at night? We'll use these. Or tremors, yeah, if they can't fall asleep or if they get woken up and that tremor keeps them up that then we direct it so it kind of it is that like peeling apart nothing's easy um unfortunately um and just really digging into what exactly you're experiencing with those non motor mm -hmm. with, um, um, you said that you treat some of these things just like you would anybody that doesn't have i was wondering about uh, ingressa i've seen a bunch of advertisements for that for um kidneys on in, on the Oh, oh yeah. Like, Not really. Um, yeah, like treating for like so because we talk about tardive dyskinesia. I will tell you that the term dyskinesia is kind of a like like trash bin word that we use that like is a description of movements, but it can come from various different areas. Like so we yeah right so it does, i we don't use it for that um it is generally used in patients with um when you say neuroleptics we're talking about antipsychotics for the most part some anti-nausea medications that it's used for but yeah even though it has that term dyskinesia it's kind of coming from a little bit of a different pathway so um and then somebody here says does cinnamon and mao and inhibitors cause a sweet tooth many question marks chocolate craving um that's a good question. Actually, I um, I haven't heard that in specific, but what that triggers me to start thinking about is a little bit of that um, impulse control issue um, that we talked about. Um, I, I said that the dopamine agonists are particularly bad about that, um, or I, they have the highest risk of that, I should say, that kind of those cravings, like just kind of being driven to, to eat sweets or overeat or overspend, those kinds of things. Um, 
it can be seen in the disease itself. This is again, this isn't that dope. That's in, we're all dealing with these dopamine systems and cinnamon activates the dopamine system. MAO inhibitors keep dopamine in your system. So it can cause a little bit of that impulsive, you know, kind of oral activities, you know, and if it's a sweet tooth, it's a sweet tooth. Some people eat, are eating a lot of potato chips or, or various different things. So it's just something I always, you know, you, know, you want to keep an eye on. If there's a lot of weight gain, we really need to talk about that. We don't want weight loss, but we don't want people getting overweight um, when they weren't before. Um, yeah. Uh, Who's the nearest specialist? Specialist at? I know. Yes. So, is there somebody in Fort Collins? Yeah, Dr. Ryan Barmore. Barmore, okay. He's in Greeley and Loveland. He's with Danner Health. Okay. D-A-R-M-O-R-D. D-A-R-M-O-R-D. And he's the only one north of Denver that I know. Okay, thank you. No, you're. The, I want to hear that because I oftentimes I actually use you guys to help me find things in people's areas. Yes. Oh, yes. And I've been treated by being treated for anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. and grief. Are these as far as the experience? Yeah, so, um, so I should say depression and anxiety is very common. Um, with Parkinson's in the in the general population. So um, I would say um, anxiety is probably our most common. Um, psychiatric disease in America, at least 10% of the population has experienced a like disabling anxiety in their lifetime. Um, but we do see it increased in our Parkinson's patients, um, both depression and anxiety. And um, a lot of it, again, there's networks in the brain that involve dopamine, but are super interconnected with our emotional regulatory states that live right next to where like the center of Parkinson's is affected. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes non-motor symptoms like mood, like constipation, like sleep issues mm -hmm. come up years, if not decades before Parkinson's motor tremor, things like that come out. And it's because these things are common, we don't necessarily, it's not that people necessarily missed it, you know, because it's, it is common and it's, there's no way of differentiating necessarily depression or anxiety in Parkinson's from somebody who doesn't have Parkinson's, there's nothing that we can differentiate that other than seeing patients who have Parkinson's and have their motor symptoms also having it, if that makes sense. But it's always so often that patients come in and they've developed a tremor or they've de developed the slowness and I start asking them about this and they're like, oh yeah, I did have that for years beforehand. Also, back to specialists, Mm -hmm. I can see the neurologist there. I get to see her. I do see the DA. Mm -hmm. Great guy. Yeah. And that's my question. The way I was detected was supposedly to do the DAB scan. Oh, DAT scan. That's the uh, DA on there. Yeah. And that was the same. Mm -hmm. I seem to be okay with that. So they mentioned that. That's yeah, and like I said, at least I know it's very difficult, and sometimes it has to be a at least a weekend, if not a week, of coming down to see somebody. But at least once, if not yearly, is really helpful. And I think. A big thing too, and I'm sorry, I won't, I won't get to you, but um, I think what's so helpful too um, is building these relationships in the community with other people who've had Parkinson's yeah. because you start learning little things and you're like, oh, I didn't even know that was an option. Um, really yeah. Um, and so I just thank everybody who puts these together because um, 
it is the unfortunate. I mean, we are trying to bolster it, but it's just, it is hard to get to, to everybody. So I think having that camaraderie and at least knowing how people to point you in the right direction, um, knowing other people who've had Parkinson's is super helpful. And to understand that other people are going through this and everybody's journey is a little bit different, but um, it can be really helpful to see what people have experienced um, so that you, I think it's it's important to have that social connection. So, yeah, yeah. I was going to say that um, most people say that they have been diagnosed for so many years, but some people can be diagnosed before there's even really big you know, tremors or something like that. Mm -hmm. and some people have been in for about 15 years. So the date of diagnosis is really has nothing to do with right. when the onset happens. So that's right. one thing hard to deal with because lots of these studies say somebody has been diagnosed in the last two years or something like that. Right, right. When it really should be symptom onset. And what really gets difficult in that is, as many of us know, Parkinson's is extremely slowly progressive. So if unless you have like a hypervigilant caregiver, sometimes we don't see that that they're slowing down, that that things are just feeling a little stiff. And it's unfortunate that a lot of people, especially that, I would say, especially rural, um, have a thought that this is just what old age is. Well, um, and then early onset is a whole other problem. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and it can be very hard for um, young onset patients because there can be a whole loneliness with that as well. Um, and I mean, Christopher pointed out that the personal loneliness is chocolate might be because most people have a declination of being able to taste things. But yes. Is something that is still in the Are you able to still taste the sweetness? Yeah. Um, so actually, the one of the very first symptoms can be loss of sense of smell. And I have patients that are like, oh, I've always had bad sense of smell. I'm like, yeah, like 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And they're like, yeah, yeah, like, you know, things started tasting different. Or like, I just, you know, became an adult and I started liking things differently. But actually, that was that was the Parkinson's. And nobody's going to get diagnosed off of just having a loss of sense of smell. That's not how you can do this, but it's really common. And I think that that's all of these things that you're saying, um, you know, you should do this, you should do that. I think that when people are first diagnosed or come into this Parkinson's world, that they're kind of shell-shocked and they don't know the right questions to ask. And I mean, we came from the medical field and we still didn't know that much about Parkinson's. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Um, let me just take one question here and then I'll answer some more of the questions too. So somebody asked, I have noticed a difference in efficacy and side effects of main and sun generic carbidopa levodopa. Is that common? Um, so interestingly, I've never found a particular pattern. Um, some people, it, I, and I, I can't give you a good answer where some people have certain gen generics that they work better with and, uh, than others. So it's very hard for me to direct that because oftentimes we can't tell that until we've experienced it yourself. Um, I will say some of that it has to do with allergies or like the additives that some people have sensitivities to, um, but that's not always, that's really not transparent from our end of things um, when we get into those kinds of details. Um, so um, oftentimes it is unfortunately just a trial and error. Um, so I know that's, I've not specifically had Maine or Sun generic come up consistently in any kind of way and there is when things go generic there's often a lot of different generics and and again it's not very transparent oftentimes pharmacies are in the background constantly changing their generics based on whatever they can get at best wholesale price so unfortunately sometimes we see patients who are like this month's different and um, it may be because of that. Um, in general though all of them have been FDA regulated and approved that there's not going to be like one that's a sugar pill or anything like that. Um, so anecdotally, I've heard the same thing about sun. Oh, really? More reliable than, than main, but it's not, it's not any sort of study. Um, but I, I think one of the main takeaways is if you think you're getting cinnamon from your pharmacist and you're never getting cinnamon, you're getting a generic, generic manufactured by different companies. And that's actually, even the pharmacy won't advertise it look at the bottle, it will say manufactured by 
naming a manufacturer by son. And that may be something if your symptoms are going up and down, you may want to pay attention to and just see if there is any correlation between the source of the generic and your symptoms. And like I said, the, it may not be transparent, but they should, if you call your yeah, pharmacy correct. or call around pharmacies, they will tell you where they're getting theirs right now. Well, and I, people tell me that they have instructed the pharmacy to only give them generic from any certain Oh, I yeah. The doctor can actually write a prescription for a generic from this place. I know people have been successful in making arrangements to get the right generic for them. Yeah. I, uh, there's no, on my end, there's no, there is a way of saying generic or non-generic, but I can't differentiate the various different generics on my end. So it is something you have to call about. Um, in general, people will have overall similar responses to, gen like, again, it has to be FDA regulated to a degree, but some people are very sensitive. Yeah, my understanding of degree is very good. Yes. <laughs> can't ask for brand name. You can't ask for brand name with the understanding that it's going to be more, co more costly. Yeah, you can ask for that. And I can, if somebody, on my end, I can also specify that brand name versus non-brand name. But when it gets into the generics, it's it, there's so nothing on my end. who are you saying is the best for your generics? So, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a doctor. No, no. I'm but not you, a pharmacist. No. Anecdotally, between, anecdotally, the one that I've heard the least complaints about is Sun. Sun? The company? Yeah, yeah. Your, your, your prescription bottle box is a manufactured by Sun. Okay. And the alternative, the, the only two I've ever seen for myself, one is Sun, the other is Main, M A Y N E. Okay. I just keep you know is my husband has a lot of There's sometimes it's good, and then there's sometimes he's not. You know, yeah, and it's it's really hard because everybody got different symptoms and different needs to call. I wanted to ask a question by hand, and yeah. it's really hard to tell. But if you notice for a long period of time, for three months he's like really down, and then for three months he's up. So he, I wonder that's about the, you know that's how long the you know when I get a prescription from the doctor they give me three months for it. They have to look at sort of general trend. You can't really look at it day to day. What, what I've noticed is, what did you call it? He's just not clear. Like brain, brain fog. Yes. And so we thought it was dosage, really. Mm. So we either went up and got brain fog, and then when we went down, it was better. So mm. is it the med dose? In general, probably what's going to have most effect is dose compared to comparatively. In general, yeah. And there's a lot of people whatever happens on a certain day, change, oh, yeah. day, 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 so it might have nothing to do with that. And and the idea of good day versus bad day. That's where I'll have patients that contact me and they say, "I had a terrible day yesterday," and I say, "I really want to see what that week versus those next couple of weeks look like because patients have such ups and downs based on." maybe they're like joint arthritis is kind of acting up and so they're feeling stiff which worsens their stiffness and their parkinson's or maybe they just didn't have a good night's sleep or maybe they have another infection like a urinary tract infection going on if something's like a huge drastic change in one moment i always want to say i want to make sure nothing else is going on because everything can worsen parkinson's to make a bad day um stress, stress. a family member gets ill uh, everybody's like my parkinson's gotten so much worse it's not the disease itself, it's all the stressors that are affecting your brain, which just make Parkinson's that much worse. So I like to see patterns rather than day, like individual days, because yeah, people are gonna have good days and bad days. I did wanna just, I think Cynthia wanted to ask a question um, via um, the computer. Cynthia, are you there? I saw your hand raised. That's my wife, yes. yes. Oh. Yes, I see uh, I was just going to ask you a question. I'm a physician in a in a small rural town in Wyoming, and I uh, do treat many patients with Parkinson's in conjunction with the neurologist, and then I have it myself, and that has really helped me uh, treat these patients. And I, I had Dr. Leahy 
there at the uh, UC Health uh, initially as my first neurologist. Yeah. And and my concern uh, is uh, about cognitive issues, mm -hmm. if there's anything that can uh, help that. Mm -hmm. And what do you think of, uh, brains uh, of um, stem cell therapy? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Two big topics. And I want to touch on those. And then I just want to say, I want to get through our research components just so that I can have time to do that. And then we'll open up for more questions, but um, I'm going to tackle first the cognitive. So um, I think also this is something that's not talked about, or it's not talked about early enough is the cognitive effect of Parkinson's. Um, and everybody, again, everybody's journey with Parkinson's is a little bit different and everybody's going to have different degrees of motor symptoms, non-motor symptoms. Um, but cognitive is something that in general, at the later stages of the disease, most patients will have some degree of cognitive issues. And within that, there is Parkinson's disease dementia. And Parkinson's disease in and of itself, you know, we talk about Alzheimer's, there's dementia, um, and there's various different kinds of dementia, Alzheimer's being the most common in America, but Parkinson's disease itself can cause a dementia at the later portions of the disease. So, yeah, not to get into the weeds, Lewy body dementia is a similar pathology, but Lewy, we call it Lewy body dementia when the dementia precedes the motor. Yeah, it depends on which one comes first. Um, so um, people who have classic Parkinson's, generally it's years of motor symptoms and then maybe a little bit of cognitive slowing and then dementia, we're talking years and years and um, decades potentially into the disease for patients. And there are a certain subset that don't experience it ever. And we're trying to figure out there are certain gene um, mutations that make it increase or decrease risk for that type of um, Parkinson's and the dementia or the cognitive issues that come with it. Um, so again, we don't have anything disease modifying um, for it. Um, again, I kind of focused on motor symptoms. There are medications um, that can be uh, benefits that, again, we use similar medications in Alzheimer's disease to kind of symptomatically treat, but it doesn't really get rid of the, the dementia itself or the cognitive impairment. It oftentimes people will say uh, their family member just seems brighter or a little sharper, um, but they can also be particularly helpful um, with um, hallucinations as well. Many of the medications can help when people are experiencing hallucinations, um, which come generally with the cognitive issues. Not always, some people will say, like they'll test perfectly normal on their cognitive issues, but they have visual hallucinations. And it just kind of depends on where the pathology is hitting the brain. Um, but some of those medications, so generally amantadine is generally something we don't like to use for people who have a lot of cognitive issues and hallucinations, because it can, Again, not worse than it is in cause worse pathology, but just cause more symptoms with it. Um, but there are some uh, dementia medications that can be used um, to just, again, symptomatically treat it. Um, so what I'm sorry? And exercise is also the main um, treatment for that. We actually find um, when it comes to healthiness of, brain, of the brain and reducing the risk of dementia, um, everybody wants to do like, Sudoku and everything like that, which is great. That's super fun. But what you really need to do is exercise, physical exercise and maintaining social connections, um, specifically connecting with other human beings um, are the two things that we see that, that slow the progression of dementia. So making sure that, of course, pandemic has been a huge issue with this, but avoiding isolating the patient um, making them at least be present when family is gathering. Even if they can't participate as much, it's important for them to be there and see uh, communication and conversation and then physical exercise. Interestingly, everybody always thinks they need to flex their brain, but they need to flex their muscles also. also. Um, and then uh, the second question. What was the second question? I'm so sorry. Stem cell. Stem cell. Stem cell. Okay, yeah. so there's been... This is always, this is brought up in most um, meetings because it's it's very exciting theoretically. Um, stem cells being, people talk about stem cell research and all kinds of things, right? Um, in neurology, we always hear about stem cell research with um, multiple sclerosis because it gets a lot of um, talk. 
but um, the idea is that stem cells being those like progenitor cells, um, the cells that we all start off as as fetuses that can split and become anything, you know, the become your brain cells, become your liver cells, all of that kind of jazz. And so this idea um, is that stem cells, can we take these little stem cells and teach them to become the things that we have lost? Um, you know, give bathe them in chemicals to make them become neurons and, and create dopamine creating neurons um, so that the things that have been lost, we can actually make those cells that have been depleted. Um, so theoretically, that's like really exciting. Um, the research has just not panned out. Um, it's extremely difficult to have something in the body and then train it to do exactly what you want it to do when that human has already been developed. Um, we just haven't found that yet. Um, so there is at this time no recommendation of getting stem cell treatment. Obviously, that's a very different thing if you have a bone cancer. Stem cell transplants are like extremely um, useful, but um, in our neuro neurological diseases, um, that's still very much a, what we call a bench research problem rather than a patient research problem right now. Bench being like, you know, the scientists, um, you know, working with mice and um, cells in that kind of way. Do they have to put that, if you did do stem cell, you have to put it actually in the brain yes. because you can't get past the drug brain barrier. So yeah, I mean, there's talk about can we can we create that various different levels of like can we just put it into the bloodstream? That would be perfect, right? right. Get into the bloodstream, it somehow finds its way up through the blood-brain barrier into the portion of the brain, and it can't just be making neurons on your spine. It has to be specifically the the neurons in your substantia nigra. First, you'd have to train it to do that. You'd have to somehow code this cell to know to do that. And then to proliferate appropriately, so enough to make progress, but not too much that it causes side effects, right? Making too much of that cell so that you develop some kind of tumor or something like that, right? Um, and that it survives your body attacking a foreign cell, right? That's the whole problem. That's why pe people who have bone cancers, when we do give them some cell treatment, they have to be, their immune system has to be floored, meaning we have to get rid of everything um, because your body is trying to protect you, and if something's coming out that's foreign, it's going to attack that. Um, so what about the brains? The The brains. The deep brain stimulation. Yeah. So that's a that is this like your brain is not going to attack that. No. Yeah, your immune system is not going to attack that because I say foreign substance, but your body really doesn't like cells because what your body was trained to attack is bacteria, right? right? Um, and parasites and things like that. If you're put, I mean, like we put metal, and we put, yeah, we put stimulators everywhere. There's no attacking um, because that's that's so foreign. It's like metal that the body doesn't So how do you have to be before you get one? Uh, deep brain stimulation? Yes. Hmm. Um, everybody's a little different. Um, it generally um, has to do with the medications having too much fluctuation. We just can't get that good on time for people. Um, so they're just spending too much time on, or they're having troublesome dyskinesias every time they get any medication in their system, even little, um, you know, whiffs of it, they're having too much of that. So That's when we start resort. talking. It's not necessarily a last resort. Um, we're actually finding more and more often that we're putting in a younger, younger patients. We're like changing that threshold that we start talking about it. Um, because we, about it. Yeah. yeah. Because because they do find that people have an improvement in quality of life with it. Yeah, it just seems like I've seen you know, the people that I've seen since they're, they're usually like pretty bad. Yeah, and that's and they don't put it in young people. Yeah, and that's historically we that that is that is the culture of like that's where we it's started with. Yeah, yeah, and that's where we started off with. But there is that slow movement towards putting it in earlier and earlier as opposed to a last resort. As we fine tune things, as we get, it's all about risk benefit, right? Yeah. Um, so we're learning as we fine tune things that that benefit outweighs the risk earlier and earlier. Yeah. I would imagine that my complaint would be bad enough that you're willing to have a life of brain surgery. Correct. Right. Right. <laughs> That's a great way of putting it. <laughs> you want to have brain surgery. You know, yeah. Is yeah. yeah. So, oh. 
yeah and then if i can just so everybody on the computer i'm oh what was that i'm sorry he was going to say something. I was just, if if i could just mention too that uh initially uh the mayo inhibitors like risagiline and acilagiline were somewhat neuroprotective has that been disproven uh, um essentially yes um there's probably no harm in starting them, so we often do start them in early onset, but um, yeah, the, there were some studies that pointed towards that, but further research has really not shown that to be the case. But they're very helpful like treatment medications, so we still continue to use them, but um, they're not pushed as much as disease modifying because that hasn't panned out, yeah. Um, if you don't mind, just so I can get the time in. Oh yeah, um, so I, I want to just mention because I promised I'd mention these for our researchers here because um, I, I just want to bring up. You know, we talk about coming um, and seeing a movement disorder specialist, and part of that is to to tune everything up and get the get you know people who have had that extra training to know the bazillion different medications that we have and the different options like deep brain stimulation and focused ultrasound. But another part is when you come generally to a movement disorder specialist, particularly if they're at a university, is that they're generally um, providing possible research options. Um, and it doesn't have to be at a university. We talk about clinical trials. Somebody mentioned over um, at Swedish, there's uh, there's definitely doctors that are doing that. Um, but um, often at our at our university, we do have we have partners with larger research projects, and then we have um personally driven you know the um investigator driven research by specific researchers down there so i just wanted to mention a couple of them there's more that may be um a little bit more specific to your case um that you're that if you come down that we can talk about but these are kind of in general for most parkinson's patients um a possibility of being involved in so um, this is the PPMI research, which is actually a national research project going on through the Michael J. Fox Foundation, which is that fun little box um, over in the corner there. Um, so if you see that little symbol, you know that um, MJF is putting it on. Um, again, this is a huge research um, project. It's enormous. It is the entire nation um, participating in this. Um, and it has very different, uh, multiple different branches. Um, but the idea is that um, we're essentially trying to understand the progression of the disease. So there is a natural course component of it. Um, there is um, looking at um, essentially how medications um, affect, you know, progression of disease over a long period of time. Um, and then also, um, uh, looking at family members as well and trying to understand um, that component as well. Um, so the important thing though, this is about the natural course. Right now we're kind of focused on the natural course of the um, of the um, disease. Um, so you can't be on any experimental drugs otherwise. There's a problem with some of these researches is you can't be in like all the different research studies because a lot of them say, well, you can't be on that drug because it could affect what we see in this study. Um, but um, this is kind of a long term. You're probably you're going to be seeing you're going to be hearing from them for at least five years. Um, and we're actively recruiting multiple people at the University of Colorado for this. Again, this is a big national study looking at the, the course of the disease in families and patients. So what we're looking for are people with Parkinson's that have been diagnosed, and again, this is the problem, but that's what we're hitting the marker as, is diagnosed within the last two years. So we want early in the disease. Um, they're not taking Parkinson's medications at all, because again, we that beginning we want to capture before people have been placed on drugs. Um, and again, I'll, some people come because they're noticing a little bit of tremor, but they don't feel like it's bothersome enough that they need meds yet. We're kind of looking for those patients. Um, they have to be 30 and over. That's most of our patients. So you can't have, unfortunately, there is something called pediatric Parkinson's. Um, and so we are, that's not what's involved. We're looking at adult onset Parkinson's here. Um, Isn't that you can't? You cannot have it without DBS. I mean, with DBS as well. It's essentially trying to capture people who are like coming in for that first visit and they don't really want to start meds. Yeah. Um, people without Parkinson's and no known risk factors as control volunteers. So the people that are this is popping up for is 
particularly helpful. I mean, children are actually in that other group called relatives of people with PD, um, either parents, siblings, or children, but we're finding a lot of uh, caregivers, um, like spouses, um, seeing that they're not necessarily at any more risk than a, like a child would, um, we're requesting them as control volunteers because the idea is to essentially look at a bunch of biomarkers. So people are gonna be getting blood taken um, to see what's different about Parkinson's patients early on. And if we can find markers that show us um, potential risk of faster progression or progression in dementia and different things like that, we need controls. We need people who don't have it to see what's different. Um, as well as relatives. So is that's also important because then we're going to take blood and say, are there any biomarkers that we can capture this disease before we know clinically that that patient has Parkinson's? Is there a blood test that we can find? Because we do not have that right now. And then the other one I talked about briefly was the REM behavior disorder. So REM behavior disorder, patients who have REM behavior disorder, I think the numbers are somewhere between 80 and 85% will go on to have a Parkinson's or Parkinson's-like disease. So those patients we're trying to capture because they're at risk of Parkinson's and they're just another class that if we can capture before people actually have symptoms and find a marker, can we like find them and help them before that? So that's pre-diagnosis. Pre-diagnosis, but they've been diagnosed. Let's say somebody's having trouble sleeping and they get a sleep study and the sleep specialist is like, hey, so you have like apnea or, or you know something or other, but interestingly, you have this thing called REM behavior disorder. We're asking all of our sleep specialists that we know to send their patients to us. Even though we don't have anything necessarily to take care of right now, from like our standpoint, we'd love to put them into this 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 um this. Um, I'm gonna have all of this. We're gonna have all the recruitment information at the end here. So I'll say this is how you would contact us about this. We have a phone number and an email. Um, but you can also just learn from the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Has a ton of information on the PPMI. Um, again, it's biomarkers. It's taking blood. Um, and um. It, well, it also includes, um, for some people, would be taking a spinal tap um, as well, which is a lumbar puncture, taking fluid from the spine, because some things are not found in blood, they're only found in the spine. Um, um, so, um, as we had already mentioned about exercise, um, this is an exercise study um, called the SPARKS, which I think is a fun name, just like sounds exercise-y. Um, so this is, a um, again, a phase three clinical trial um, looking at aerobic exercise, meaning those exercises that get that heart rate up, the treadmill, the bike. Um, so we're looking again, this is generally early onset disease and for people who have not started meds yet. Um, again, so we're trying to capture these this sliver of patients. And the problem is, is that most patients don't come to us until they're well into the disease. General neurologists, their primary care physicians are dealing with it early on. So it's just helpful hearing from you guys. If you see anybody who's reaching out to you as a group um, that's just newly diagnosed and saying, hey, I'm looking for information, it would be wonderful if they if they say, I'd love to contribute to research in any way for them to come and say, um, see us or talk to us. Um, and the the sparks trial is you also can't be in you can't be super exercisey already is the unfortunate thing we're looking for those people who like aren't really very good at exercising already so um, that's actually a problem here in like Colorado and Wyoming everybody's so outdoorsy um, that I've actually had several patients who are very excited about this and I said you know you're already a marathon runner and I'm sorry that's like that's not what we are looking for um, so. Um, and then we have, um, so this is pretty fun, um, the music therapy clinical trial. Um, particularly, we talk about people have that trouble with the fine motor skills, buttons, even pulling out their pills, trying to do those kinds of things, zippers. Um, if that's something that's particularly bothersome, um, yeah, typing on a keyboard using your mouse, um, we're looking at if um, essentially utilizing music and like learning music, um, can be of help with improving that fine motor skill. Because if you think about it, playing the piano and all those kinds of things can be particular, they're like very fine motory, right? Um, so this one's a little bit easier. You can be on medications. Um, so this is really for anybody with Parkinson's disease of a very large age. Um, the only thing is that, again, with all of these clinical trials, they are at the university, so it does involve coming down. Yeah, any thought been given to 
combining this with cognitive uh, decline studies because um, actually I started taking piano lessons like three years ago as an attempt to just try to do as much as possible yeah. and doing yeah. one thing with your right hand and another thing with your left hand and, and, and cr your creating those and connections. Yeah. Is really damn hard. It is very. And that typically is what Gary says here is progressing cognitive decline in theory. Yeah. So um, that's a very good question. I don't think there's anything actively going on, but I do know, um, I do know in particular that the um, the investigator behind this is like that's all. She's very much in music therapy, and I believe I don't know if I know she's. Can you answer this? I mean, like. I'm a music therapist. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, playing an instrument is Um, let me see where I'm at. Yeah, okay. Um, because I only I know we just have a few more minutes, and I'm gonna hang around if people have questions in person. But I know like we need to wrap up and everything. Um, Topaz, um, this is uh, also like very open to most people. Anybody over um age oh age of 60 so you have to be over age of 60 and have parkinson's and this is looking at um an injectable zoledronic acid which is a bone strengthening um medication so um because our patients are at risk of falls um this is looking at if you take this medication is there a decreased risk of fracture you know down the line um, for our patients because they are kind of at that fall risk. Um, so this would involve um, essentially a short exam and in, an injection of the medication and then every four months essentially just a survey. So this one's probably one of the least like intensive um, of them that you can be involved in. Um, and then um, this is, oh, so then this one is also kind of like a uh, generally one of the easier ones for patients, especially in more rural areas or areas away from a movement disorders group. Um, it's called PD Generations. It's like generation. And I think it's a great play on word because it's talking about genetics. So it's talking about genes. It's talking about your family. Um, so this is open to just about anybody at any age with Parkinson's disease. And um, I will say we're talking about this with almost all of our Parkinson's patients um, in clinic. Um, so it's all over the country um, and it is um, genetic testing of these seven Parkinson's um, related genes, genes that have been known to increase your risk of Parkinson's. Um, and um, it is essentially providing your genetic material so that you gain information about your genetics. So it's genetic testing, you will get the results of what your genes are um, of these seven genes and whether you have a mutation in them or not. Um, but you go into a genetic bank, which is then used for further research. So that's the, you can get genetic testing without being in a research project. I will just caveat that, but this provides that you're providing back to the research community. What's nice about this one is you actually get genetic counseling via the phone from a geneticist with it for free. Um, just for Parkinson's, just for, so like they will talk to you about your results and what a negative test means, what like a positive test and what, whichever gene, but they won't talk about, I I know, it'll be focused on just that. So this is for the patient. This is for the patient. It is, it is helpful. We are not recommending at this time genetically testing patient uh, children of people who have Parkinson's unless they're symptomatic. Um, because these genes, these genes aren't that like you're going to have, if you have this gene, you have blue eyes. This is like, if you have this gene, you have a 20% increased risk of developing Parkinson's. So even if the child has it, doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get Parkinson's. So we don't necessarily recommend doing it right now. The reason we want to do it is because I talked about that next frontier is gene-based therapies. So these pa the idea of getting all of this and banking all of these patients is that once we can develop a drug that focuses in on these genes, that we can contact all those patients and start them on treatment or put them into studies for that gene. Yeah. This one is all um, online, or can be done remotely. All done remotely. So, 
I also will caveat, it's so, I don't think they knew how popular this was going to be because we're sending it on like all of our patients. They are a little backed up. So if you really want to know your genetic results like tomorrow, well, you're not going to like find out tomorrow, but if you want to know it within a couple of weeks, um, then generally I would not go this route. I'm just caveating that it's like pretty backed up. Um, I, but it is, you will eventually get the results. So. You know, just connected for making use of previous studies requiring microbial plots. Yes, so this is wrapping up. Yeah, this is wrapping up into a lot of, it's essentially going into a bank, like a okay. large patient bank. Um, yeah, so that one is, yeah. And so like this can all be done remotely. Um, the, the kit can be sent to your house. You do the swab or if they want blood, you just go to like your local blood thing and just bring the packet and everything. They ship it out. The genetic counseling is all over the phone. So it's really, really easy um, for people who have a hard time coming down. Um, so like I said, this can be all online or in person. Um, and so I'll just leave this up if people want to write this down. Essentially, any any of the studies that we're involved in, you can contact. This is like the way to get through. Um, and we have, if you prefer, instead of writing down, we have a ton of resources back there um, at our table if you want to take just the cards if it's easier than that. So, or you just take pictures. Well, that's fine too. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much, guys. We are at overtime. So, um, I hope I've been able to answer plenty of questions. Um, it's been great getting to know all of you. Again, I'm going to be hanging around. I know we got to break down and everything, so I'm going to hang around um, for that. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Are you open to your slides being yeah. shared? Um, yes, okay. absolutely. So we can um, share these slides for yeah. people on the webinar as well as all of you. I can email them to you. Mm -hmm. so just double your email. Thank you, Dr. Heiser. That was yeah. wonderful. Of course, guys. Oh, thank you. So. Uh, um, okay. Next, I would just like to give a thank you to our sponsors again. If you guys would like to come up and say a few things. Um, again, we have Accorda, UC Health, and Sopernus here today. Um, I urge the people that are here in person to go and talk with these representatives. Um, they're knowledgeable and wonderful, um, so please go check out their booths. Hi, my name is Carrie Harden. I'm a research coordinator and recruiter at uh, CU Onshits. Um, so I'm in clinic about a couple of times a week. And um, so thank you for having us. I'm happy to be here. Um, I can answer more questions about the neurologic music therapy. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, I can answer a lot of questions about the music therapy and any of the other studies. We have cards. Oh, you want to have a question? Guitar. Guitar. Our studies are mostly done are on the are with the piano. But I mean, any if you play any type of instrument, that's going to it has a lot of benefits. Um, you know, beyond just learning your instrument. And I always tell my clients and my students, you don't even have to play well. So don't even, you know, because everybody goes, oh, I'm not, I'm not. Just throw that out the window. Just doing it is a benefit, um, even if you're not great at it. So, we don't yeah. expect you to go out tomorrow. No, <laughs> no. Um, so, yes, thank you. I'm back at the table and happy to answer any questions. Yep. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for spending your Saturday with us, and uh, special thanks to Park for putting this on, and Dr. Heiser as well. That was a great recap. I think we all learned uh, a good amount from that. Uh, I'm Paul with Supernus Pharmaceuticals, um, so I'll be in the back there, have some information for you all. But um, the nice part is, in the last two to three years, Supernus has really just dove into supporting you know events like this with the Parkinson's Association of the Rockies um, and at this point we're at we're at about four medications specifically for Parkinson's so um, if you have any questions about that throughout the entire you know journey for patients with Parkinson's we, we've got an option for you uh, to take to your doctor talk to them about that so feel free to swing by the back and we'll leave you some info thanks for coming <laughs> All right, I will be closing the webinar. Um, feel free to email um, what's on the screen and always email um, the Parkinson Association with any questions or um, give us a call.
Thank you for joining today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.